All right, I think it's time for us to get started with today's workshop. Uh, before I pass it back to Natalia Abrams to get us started, just want to remind folks just one more time that we are here to answer your questions. Uh, there will be a lot of information we shared today, uh, so use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. We will uh, take moments throughout the workshop to stop, talk about these topics, uh, and make sure that we clarify uh, any of the important details. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it to Natalia Abrams, the Executive Director of Student Debt Crisis, to get us started. Thank you, uh, Cody. And uh, we are also today joined by Lindsay Clark, the Director of External Affairs at Savvy, one of our partners. Lindsay, do we have you on the, on the call? Hi, Natalia. Yes, uh, it's great to be here with everyone and looking forward to, uh, to working with you all today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and today, we're really excited to introduce our new Student Loan Borrower Outreach Program. Uh, here for folks in California and frankly anyone that you know that needs help with their student loan debt nationwide. Uh, but we have brought together an entire uh, center for you all that includes access to the workshop that you're on today and also <clears throat> includes uh, uh, use of the Savvy tool, which Lindsay will talk about shortly. And she has been brought on to be uh, as a great partner savvy of ours for a while now but they've joined with us in the student loan borrower outreach program um, along with young invincibles here in california and some other really great groups so we want you to have this all completely free of charge be able to learn about your student loans learn about the repayment options especially right now during covid for many folks that may have lost their jobs or had reduced hours be able to enroll in programs for free um, and just kind of take a look at what's there uh, for you in your own time because we know we're going to give you a lot of information. So we just wanted to say a little bit about today's workshop. So we are education and consumer advocates who are here to help you. Um, you know, we're borrowers ourselves helping you as student loan borrowers. But what we are not are attorneys or financial counselors and we're not affiliated with the Department of Education. And that's actually an important point, um, as you'll see when we talk about student debt scams, that there are a lot of companies that will lie to you and say that they are affiliated when they're not. And so that's a disclaimer we like to make, but all of the information you can find at the Department of Education's website or by registering with a Savvy account through uh, this great tool we'll show you very shortly. Um, and then also most of this information, almost everything applies to federal student loans. Um, and we'll show you how to kind of figure out whether you have federal or private student loans. And there will be time for questions and answers throughout the entire workshop. And at the end, you can use the Q&A box and we will try to verbally get to your questions throughout the workshop. So we just kind of want to show you what's going on um, as a national snapshot with student loan debt. We know that you probably know this yourself. Uh, that so many student loan borrowers are struggling. We have, you know, four million borrowers here in California alone, and 45 million in the country. And we know that student debt has really become a civil rights issue. And you can see this this snapshot that half of Black or African American borrowers are behind on their loans, um, or uh, black women who are the most impacted group of people uh, with student loan debt, 56%, um, they have 56% more than their white counterparts of student loan debt. And the overall debt, over a trillion dollars of student loan debt is owed by women alone. So, you know, we think it's important that folks know, we know that this is an economic issue of impacting all of us, but really is a civil rights issue as well. And we see that through this domino effect of negative impact on wealth. Um, we see that student loan debt prevents home ownership. Uh, you know, more than half of first time homeowners have troubles getting a down payment. I, I know here in California, real estate's insane. Um, for so many people, it just completely feels out of reach and often due to our student loan debt. Um, and so many folks, you know, especially uh, we see here in California, our Latinx borrowers are more, more prone to unemployment, especially during, during times of this economic crisis that we're in of COVID-19 crisis. So, you know, we're here um, 
to help you with your student loan debt. We know that there's a lot of probably other areas that we uh, wish we could help you with, but um, if we can help, you know, alleviate one of those issues by taking your monthly payment if you're struggling to make it um, and sharing also all of the federal updates, that's what we're here for. So first we're gonna just talk about like how to find your student loan and the basics of student loans because often people do not know if they have a federal or private loan. We're going to share resources with you and there will always be important notes at the end of every section. So here you go. Uh, what are federal loans? What are private loans? So federal loans, if you remember way back when you applied for college and you filled out a FAFSA form, uh, those are your federal loans. These are need-based given to you by the Department of Education um, or if you're like myself with older loans, they may have been given to you by a bank, but still connected to the Department of Education. Uh, your interest is either subsidized or not subsidized, but you do get, a, you have available these repayment plans um, and hardship deferment and default rehab and public service loan forgiveness. All of those are going to be available only for federal loans. And then you have private loans, which are often given to you directly from a bank they are based on your credit history. Uh, with those loans, uh, your interest begins immediately, and they do not have the same repayment options that the federal loans um, provide. Here's an example of who, the type of companies that you may be dealing with. As you can see, companies like Navient uh, service your, both federal and private loans. So just because Navient's your servicer doesn't automatically mean you have one type of loan or the other. And we will show you, you know, where to go to make sure you know you have the federal loan. So what should your federal loan servicer do for you? What is their job? So their job, um, they are contracted out by the Department of Education. Our tax dollars pay uh, for these folks to take care of our loans, um, and we hear so much from borrowers that they don't do a good job, but they should be taking care of your payments and processing them. They should be telling you about all of the available repayment programs and what options are the best for you. This is where we see a real failure with student loan servicers, where they often do not put you into the correct program. Um, and then they also should be sending you communications. And currently, right now, during CARES Act, you should have been hearing from your servicer quite a bit, um, telling you and informing you of the recent updates. So even when you get to federal loans, it's not just so simple of federal versus private. There's, of course, different types of federal loans. So they're grouped into kind of three groupings, um, REC loans, which are, the majority of them have been offered since 2010. However, there were some before. Um, these are the loans that are the most um, generous, get you to the most generous repayment programs and also will get you into public service loan forgiveness. Um, you can always consolidate into the direct loan program. There are Perkins loans. Those are loans given to you by your school. And then there are older federal family education loans. And these are loans that were issued before 2010, I mentioned a little earlier, often uh, these loans were issued by a bank, even though they were from the Department of Education. And for example, my loan came from Wells Fargo, but it was a Department of Education loan. So just to give you an example of what that loan can look like. So those older loans, um, there are still some repayment programs for them. However, depending on where you're at in the process, some folks consolidate so they can take advantage of public service loan forgiveness or the more generous income-driven repayment options. And so here's where you go to find your information. Um, studentaid.gov is a Department of Education website. And if you sign in here, if you don't remember your PIN, uh, it's fine, you can create a new one, create an account or log in. And if your loans are here, then you have federal loans. If your loans are not here, then 99% of the time, you do not have federal loans. So this is like a perfect place to start if you're confused, if you do not know, uh, if you do not see or have any loans in the system, then uh, the other way is to check your credit report to see if you have federal loans, um, excuse me, private loans. 
So when you go to studentaid.gov and enter in your information, this is what you're going to see. And you're going to see the type of loan. You can see that in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, that says direct. So you now have a direct loan versus a shell loan. You will see how much you owe, how much you've borrowed, your loan status, if you have graduated, if you're currently in school, and then if you'll see lower down on repayment information, you'll see the repayment program that you're in. So this gives you a lot of information and is very helpful um, and a great place to start if you don't know what type of loan you have or are just starting to want to pay or need to pay your student loans back. As I said before, finding private loans. If there's nothing at studentaid.gov, um, did you have a co-signer? Uh, that's one thing that could easily be a private loan. Uh, check your credit report, really key place. That is where most private loans will show up. And then of course, you can always contact your servicer and ask them. And as we said before, it is their job to provide you clear information. So I'm just gonna stop here on the loan stuff. And I know that a lot of this is probably new information to folks. It's a lot of stuff. Don't worry, we will you know, send you <laughs> these slides as an update. And also just to remind you, you can always go to the new resource center that we've built and the links will be shared in the Zoom chat with you all and see all of this and kind of take your own time to understand it because we do understand that it's you know hefty material and it's a lot to kind of sort through so don't worry you're not alone we feel the same way and you know to add on to all that information there are these new covid related updates of the cares act and a new executive action that directly relates to student loan borrowers so with the current CARES Act, um, this suspends payments for most student loan borrowers until September 30th and waives interest, meaning interest is currently at 0%. Um, this time currently counts towards public service loan forgiveness. Uh, just to clarify, this started uh, March 13th, uh, and then it also counts for your income driven repayment programs. At this point in time, payments, all payments should be suspended and uh, they're not being reported for, it's, excuse me, it's being reported as on time on your credit reports. So this halt is for those uh, that are delinquent or uh, struggling uh, in default, this halts uh, involuntary collections, meaning you should not have wage garnishments, you should not have any uh, social security withholdings. If this has happened to you, you can always contact us at info at student.crisis.org. We will also share that link for those that are in the chat. Uh, in addition, that you should not be receiving any collection calls until September 30th. Um, and also, students um, that have been forced to withdraw from their college can cancel their direct loan for that period uh, that they needed to withdraw from school. So then, after Congress passed CARES Act and uh, extended it through September uh, 30, 30th, excuse me, uh, the president took executive action about two weeks ago and has now paused all payments and interest for the majority of federal loans. I want to be clear about that. It, there, it is all uh, federal, direct federal loans and of family federal education loans. Unfortunately, about half were not included. Commercially held, held cell loans and Perkins loans are not included in either the CARES Act or the executive action. That was about 8 million borrowers. There are borrowers that unfortunately have all different types of loans. So it's very important to go to studentaid.gov to see the type of loan. Um, we know that some borrowers were not included, but for the 35 million plus borrowers that were included, you do not have to pay your student loan debt until January 1st, and right now you are not accruing any interest. Also, this counts if you're still working in your public service job towards public service loan forgiveness and towards loan rehabilitation programs. If, <clears throat> for those of you that have been in an income-driven repayment program, 
if your recertification deadline for the repayment plan falls in between this deadline, it will be pushed back and we are still trying to gain more clarity on how long past that December 31st deadline. Uh, in addition, this new executive action will also pause involuntary collection and debt collection until December 31st. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay Clark with Savvy, who is going to kind of untangle all of the stuff we're going to share with you and show you a really simple way for you to do it because like we know that this is a lot and we're here to help you untangle it. And very honored that this tool is available to all of the borrowers that are joining this workshop free of charge. Lindsay? Great, thanks so much, Natalia. Um, and it's, it's great to be with you all. So just as Natalia mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who we are at Savvy and what we do, uh, and more importantly, how we can help you as a student loan borrower in a number of different ways, um, but most importantly, to be able to sort of quickly, efficiently, and accurately enroll in some of these programs that are going to hopefully help you to whether it's lower your monthly payment or potentially um, enroll in forgiveness. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I'm just going to talk a bit about who we are at Savvy. Um, we are a social impact tech startup based in Washington, D.C., about a block from the White House. We were founded by two guys coming from the policy and advocacy world. Uh, they had actually helped write some of the legislation uh, around programs like income-driven repayment plans. And so they've been advocating and fighting on behalf of borrowers for over a decade, uh, realized how difficult it was to navigate so many of these programs. Uh, and so decided to build a technology platform to help borrowers uh, better understand this process, uh, but navigate it successfully from start to finish. You know, not only submit that application, but actually get enrolled in that program and receive the, the, you know, the benefit uh, at the end. So really you know, end to end support um, through that process. Uh, our average user uh, saves about $156 uh, a month on their student loan payments by enrolling in an income driven repayment plan. Uh, which comes out to about $28,000, you know, across the lifetime of their loan. Um, so this is just some of the savings around income-driven repayment that Savvy helps borrowers uh, to take advantage of. So if we go into the next slide, uh, this is just a basic overview of, of how the Savvy tool works. Essentially, uh, we are going to collect information around your tax filing status, your income, your employment. All of this is to help us identify the optimal repayment and forgiveness plan is eligible for you as a borrower. Uh, so we're gonna check your eligibility around these programs. You're then gonna be able to select the repayment plan that we've identified for you if, if that's the one that you want to do. And we sort of take it a step further, digitally enroll within a matter of seconds uh, into this program. Uh, we complete all the forms, we pre-fill them digitally for you, we review them and make sure that they get submitted to your servicer quickly and accurately. And the sooner they're in, the sooner that you can take advantage of a lower payment uh, that next month. So if we go on to the next page, perfect. Uh, so these are some of the, the aspects uh, and features of, of the Savvy technology and platform itself. We have a database of all of the PSLF and teacher loan forgiveness eligible employers in the country. All the school districts, um, you know, all of the 501c3 nonprofits uh, and government entities, uh, potentially if you are eligible for something like forgiveness. Uh, so we're going to be able to flag that for you as a borrower uh, and help you to take advantage of that. Uh, we also help borrowers uh, to sync their loans automatically. So most of you, I'm sure, have anywhere between five to six different student loans uh, with different disbursement dates, interest rates, and all, the, all that stuff. If you knew that off the top of your head, I'd be very impressed, uh, but most borrowers don't. So we use what's called a loan sync, and we actually use a, a company called Plaid, which if you have a Venmo account or anything like that, you use Plaid to sync your other financial accounts. Uh, and it's gonna sync that loan data right over into the tool so that we can basically have a, a sense of you know, your most recent and updated information and give you the most accurate uh, picture at what you would be eligible for. So this whole process of going through Savvy is really just a personalized uh, repayment and forgiveness plan uh, that we, we sort of show you at the very end. So if you want to go ahead, you can follow along while you're, you're, I'm walking through this with you all right now uh, to borrowers.buysavvy.com, and we'll put that in the chat so you can access that easily. Again, for anyone on the phone, that's borrowers, B-O-R-R-O-W-E-R-S dot buysavvy, B-Y-S-A-V-I dot com. 
And this is where you're going to be able to access the entire suite of, of savvy services uh, and, and technologies at no cost to you, the borrower, absolutely no cost. Um, and so this is really, we're, we're so excited to be able to offer this sort of premium level of services to you all um, so that you can utilize the technology uh, and get enrolled in these programs. So if we go ahead on to the next screen, perfect. So as I, as I described earlier, this is uh, just a quick look at that loan sync. You're gonna be able to identify your loan servicer. So in this case, Navian, if you have more than one servicer, you can, you can sync more than one. Uh, enter in your username and password credentials, and it's gonna sync over that loan data in a matter of seconds. You can also sync your private loan data. And so while the programs that we are discussing here today are not eligible uh, for private loans, it's still an important part of your student loan picture. Uh, and so you can sync that just the same way you would your federal loan. Entering in that commercial lender, whether that's Chase, Wells Fargo, whatever it may be, enter in the username and password, uh, and you'll be able to sync those loans over the exact same way. It'll flag for our team that they are private, and we'll be able to follow up with you uh, with, with additional guidance around those private loans. And moving on to this last screen, perfect. So this is a look at what the, the last sort of and final stage in the, the technology and the platform itself uh, looks like. This is where we identify your optimal repayment and potentially, if you're eligible, forgiveness plan. Um, so in this case, we identified the borrower could lower uh, his monthly payment down to $121 a month, uh, so a savings of around $350. Uh, we provide all the information around what type of income-driven repayment plan this is, uh, so the borrower is aware of their options. Um, and if they want to move forward with that plan, they can do so from that screen. So again, that's borrowers.buysavvy.com. Uh, I highly encourage you to, to go and create your free account uh, to, to try to get as far as you can in the process and enter in that information so that we can be able to help you uh, in any way that we can. Great. This is a look at one of our, our newest features on the platform that you are all going to have access to. Uh, this is what we call the borrower dashboard. So when you create a savvy account and then log back into that account at any point in time, this is the first screen you're going to see. And this is basically a look at exactly where you are in the process around your repayment and or forgiveness. So this is our way of, of, of helping to be tra as trans uh, transparent as possible with you, the borrower, um, making sure we've set appropriate expectations. It also allows us to monitor your application. And this is one of the great things about um, savvy service is that when we submit an application on your behalf, if that application is taking longer than we, we expect that it should to be reviewed by your servicer, we are going to follow up and help uh, sort of make sure that your servicer uh, acts in good faith and that that application has the desired outcome that we wanted it to achieve. And we won't stop until it does. So we are really sort of advocates on your behalf, uh, and this is one of the ways in which we help you to do that. It's also a way in which you can contact one of our experts. Um, so whether at the bottom right hand corner or the left hand side, you'll see contact an expert. Uh, you can click any of those. And if you go onto the next screen, you're going to see uh, sort of the full savvy support network that is at your disposal. So whether that's via email, via designated phone line, or in the bottom right hand corner of every screen in the tool is that green support button. You can click that and either send a message or a chat with our support team. Uh, our support, our, our in-house experts, are standing by ready and waiting and, and really willing to help you uh, as much as possible. And I highly encourage you to take advantage uh, of them as a resource in whatever capacity makes sense, um, because this is, again, a, a no-cost tool, uh, and our goal is to really try to provide you uh, with immediate impact and benefit uh, on your student loans. So again, that's borrowers.buysavvy.com, and that's where you can go to create your account and access the Savvy platform at no cost. And I think we can go on to the next screen, great. So uh, now that you all, all are aware uh, of the Savvy tool at your disposal, we're now gonna talk a little bit about some of the federal student loan repayment plans. So we're gonna first talk about the standard plan, um, something called temporary hardship, so deferment and forbearances. Uh, and then we're gonna go into a little bit around loan consolidation. So if we go on to the next screen, perfect. So, uh, whenever one graduates, they are automatically put onto what's called the standard plan, all right? This is sort of the default repayment plan. And this essentially um, assumes that you're going to pay that loan off in 10 years and calculate your monthly payment accordingly, all right? So for many borrowers, you have a, a very high debt amount. Uh, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm a student loan borrower myself. I have a little over $200,000 in student loan debt. 
So I hope that makes at least some of you feel better about your own situation on the call right now. Uh, so that's, that's how I like to, to try to do that. Um, so if I was to be on a standard plan, all right, and pay that loan off in 10 years, that would mean I would be paying three or $4,000 a month on my student loan payments. Very, very high amount. Okay? And this is why so many borrowers were struggling to make those payments uh, because they were based solely on their debt amount. All right, so that is the 10-year standard repayment plan. Moving on, many times for borrowers who weren't able to make those payments, uh, there are temporary hardships in the form of deferment or forbearance. And I'm sure you know, many of you might be familiar with this. I certainly have taken advantage of uh, deferment and forbearance uh, throughout the course of, of my you know, repayment. Um, but essentially it is a pause uh, on those payments uh, while still accruing interest uh, in certain circumstances. Um, now, I want to make sure that everyone's aware of the fact that right now, if you are eligible under the CARES Act, your loans are technically in an administrative forbearance, okay? The difference between a normal forbearance that you might enter into because you're unable to make your payment and the CARES Act forbearance that you're under right now is that you're currently accumulating no interest, the interest is at 0%, right? Whereas when you are in a normal forbearance, that interest is accumulating, and when you go back into repayment, it's going to capitalize, which means it's going to be tacked on to the principal balance of your loan, and you're gonna start having to make payments on that. And this is really why so many borrowers, and I, I say this myself, make the statement, you know, I've been paying on my loans for years, and the balance is the same, if not higher, than it was when I started. And that's because of capitalized interest. All right, but again, deferment and forbearance are, are great benefits of federal loans that borrowers can take advantage of. Uh, outside of this CARES Act period, um, you know, when, they, when and if they are struggling to make that payment. Moving on to federal loan consolidation. Consolidation, okay, combines multiple loans, of the federal loans, into a new single loan uh, with one monthly payment, okay? One of the reasons why you might pursue a consolidation uh, is if you have a loan type uh, that does not currently qualify for, let's say, an income-driven repayment plan or public service loan forgiveness. One of those loan types happens to be the FEL loan, F-F-E-L, which stands for Federal Family Education. If you have a FEL loan, that loan is not going to be eligible for, for public service loan forgiveness. However, if you consolidate that loan into a direct consolidation loan, it will become eligible. All right. So many times borrowers will consolidate their loans in order to make them eligible for some of the programs that we're going to talk about here today. You can also consolidate your loans uh, in order to to basically get out of default. It is sort of a get out of jail free card, um, and it essentially um, allows a borrower to, uh, to create a new loan right away and basically take that defaulted loan and put it into good standing. It can only be done once, okay? Um, but that is a way in which someone might be able to get out of default. You can only consolidate in general once. So if you, you know, consolidate because you wanna make your loans eligible for forgiveness or you know, that's the only time you can do it, right? So if you fall into default, you won't be able to consolidate your way out. You'll have to, to go through a regular rehabilitation. So that's sort of the gist around consolidation. So it can be an effective tool in, in different scenarios for those who want to become eligible for other programs, as well as those who might be, you know, like I said, in, in default situation and want to get that loan into good standing as quickly as possible. Okay, moving on to income-driven repayment plans. Um, now, these are sort of the, the driving focus uh, of what we do here at Savvy uh, because they are so powerful in a way for borrowers uh, to, to provide themselves with immediate relief uh, on their student loans. So we're going to talk about what they are, uh, some of the online resources, uh, and the application process surrounding income-driven repayment, or IDR, as I'll refer to it from here on out. So what is an income-driven repayment plan? Well, uh, I was telling you on the previous screen that a standard plan, right, was a, a plan based on your debt amount. Well, an income-driven repayment plan, uh, IDR, is based not on your debt amount, but on your income as well as your family size and things like your tax filing status. So what that helps to do in many cases for borrowers is to significantly lower that monthly payment for borrowers who have a particularly high debt-to-income ratio. So your monthly payment, instead of being calculated based on your debt amount, is calculated uh, as a percentage of your discretionary income. And discretionary is sort of a fancy word for gross income. So that means before taxes, 
All right. So it's on a sort of a sliding scale range between 10 to 20 percent of that gross income. It also takes into consideration things like your uh, family size, particularly child dependence. For every child dependent that you have, that's going to lower that monthly payment by about $50 per child, even unborn child dependents. If you just found out you were pregnant, that can count. You can uh, mark that as an unborn child dependent on the form uh, and submit that, and it will lower that payment by another $50. So these are all some of the nuances around IDR plans that borrowers are able to uh, take advantage of to help minimize that monthly payment. There are different types of IDR plans. Okay, so income driven is the uh, umbrella term, right? The, the plans you see here in green or the, the uh, uh, names you see here in green are the different types of income driven repayment plans. Uh, revised pay as you earn, pay as you earn, new income based repayment, income based repayment, and income contingent repayment, all right? I wouldn't worry too much about trying to uh, dive head, in, head first into the nuances and differences between all of these plans. Depending upon when your loans were dispersed and what you know, type of loan you have, you're going to qualify uh, for a range or, or certain you know, types of IDRs over others. One of the great things about the Savvy tool uh, is that when you go through and enter in your information, we're going to be able to identify the optimal retirement plan for you um, without you sort of having to worry about uh, you know, any of these sort of details around you know, repay versus pay versus IDR. Uh, it can get you know, a bit into the weeds and a bit confusing. Um, but you know, generally, uh, it might be helpful to know that you know, at the bottom end, a repay is going to take about 10% of that income, whereas ICR, income contingent, will take about 20% of that income. All right, moving on to the next slide. So this is a sort of a sliding scale look. Uh, at the 10-year standard plan versus what you would pay on an income-driven repayment plan. Uh, so if your income um, was $30,000 or lower, um, you would potentially pay uh, as low as $0 a month on an income-driven repayment plan. As far as the standard plan goes, that payment's going to stay the same regardless of your income, right? It's gonna be based on your debt amount. So $359 is going to be that, that payment amount no matter what your income is. However, on an IDR plan, it's going to fluctuate based on your income. So if your income is going to increase or is higher, then that, that monthly payment will also be higher. All right, so you know, the higher your income goes, the higher that monthly payment could potentially go as well. So this is just a look at that comparison between those plans. Now, how to qualify for an IDR plan. Uh, so the, the primary plans that you see right in front of you here, repay, pay, IDR, ICR, okay? Um, they are all for pretty much federal loans, um, which, which should have been sort of clear. No private loans are eligible for any of these IDR plans. Uh, some, however, are only eligible for direct loans, uh, and that is repay and pay, okay? Uh, and some also have a partial financial hardship requirement uh, as well, and that's pay and IDR, as well as pay is, is only eligible for new borrowers. So again, these are some of the nuances that I wouldn't worry too much about. Um, What's great about the Savvy tool, if you, if you can utilize it, is that it, it will identify which plan is going to be best for your situation uh, and your eligibility for you. So you won't have to worry about trying to differentiate uh, on your own. Now, as far as how to enroll in an IDR plan, uh, when you submit an IDR application, okay, you must uh, attach supporting documentation uh, to your income that can come in the form of your most recent tax return, your 1040 form, or a current pay stub. You submit that application and your servicer essentially takes a snapshot of that income at that point in time and locks in that payment for 12 months, all right? When those 12 months come and go, all right, you will have what's called a recertification deadline. And by that deadline, you must resubmit your IDR application with updated income documentation, right? So it's been a year later, has anything changed? So you resubmit the application, updated income documentation, your servicer recalculates that payment, takes that snapshot and locks it in for another 12 months. Okay, that's, and sort of, you can repeat that over and over, right? Year over year. That is essentially the, the process. That recertification deadline is very important, okay? Last year, 56% of borrowers missed their recertification deadline. And when you miss that deadline, two very important things happen. 
first of all, you immediately fall out of that IDR program. So the next month's payment is going to go right back up to that standard plan amount, which for many people uh, is going to be a lot higher. And second of all, any interest that you accumulated over the course of that year, which could be a lot, you know, especially if you we were trying to minimize that payment as much as possible, any interest is going to be capitalized and tacked onto your principal balance. Um, so I know, you know Cody can speak from experience. I, I will, I'm going to tell you about my experience here, um, but it, that is something that you really want to try to avoid. Many years ago, before I started working at Savvy and know what I know now, I was on an IDR plan. I missed my recertification deadline because I just didn't think much of it. I didn't think that there were consequences. And I recently looked back and saw that within 48 hours of missing that deadline, I had $15,000 in capitalized interest tacked onto my principal balance. And that's why my loan balances have not gone down, but you know, if anything, increased over the years despite making payments on those loans. So this is entirely avoidable. Um, and this is also something that Savvy helps borrowers to do. Two months out from that deadline, we reach out to you, uh, start to collect the necessary documentation around this application. Uh, we we you know, complete the application for you, submit it on your behalf, make sure that payment is as minimized as possible, uh, and make sure that it, it is accepted by your servicer and that you are pretty much all set to go well before that deadline even becomes a concern. Uh, so this is one of the ways in which Savvy's monitoring and submission really helps borrowers to avoid anything like this um, happening in, in the future. Now, one of my sort of favorite terms, uh, because I think it is, is so uh, important for all of you to be aware of, um, is the application abyss. And essentially, this is what happens, and I'm sure many of you might have already experienced this, I know I have, uh, when um, a borrower submits an application, whether it be for an income-driven repayment plan or maybe uh, for a type of uh, forgiveness program, and doesn't hear back cr cr crickets from your, from your servicer, all right? Sometimes borrowers simply forget that they even submitted it to begin with. But certain applications should only take a certain amount of time. For example, under normal circumstances, an IDR application, when you submit that, should take no more than two weeks, maybe four weeks tops to be reviewed by your servicer, okay? Uh, and so if it's taking longer than it should, uh, and first and foremost, it's important to be informed and aware of how long these processes should take. And that's where we can help you and come in. Um, you have sort of uh, things at your disposal uh, to escalate that situation uh, in the form of a complaint, uh, whether that's through the ombudsman system or the CFPB. Um, but you have the ability to uh, trigger a review of your account and, and force your servicer to essentially have to address uh, your application of the issue. Um, there are so many obstacles uh, as far as the, uh, the servicer is concerned that can cause these delays. Uh, and the servicers have been sued left and right for sort of negligence and, and malpractice around these things. Uh, and so this is also where Savvy uh, helps borrowers as, as sort of an advocate. You know, we not only monitor to make sure that that application, you know, if it's taking too long, we'll help to get on the phone with you and your servicer and figure out what's, you know, what's going on. Um, but when we submit an application for a borrower, we have a 99% acceptance rate because we know how exactly to fill out that application. We make sure that there are no clerical errors, that the forms attached are correct, et cetera. It's very easy to uh, attach the incorrect form or perhaps leave a digit off your social security number and they will re reject your application for the smallest thing. All right, so there's so much involved in this process um, and it, it really is helpful to have uh, some type of resource, you know, whether it be the Department of Education student debt crisis or the savvy tool to help you enroll in these programs uh, in a way that uh, doesn't feel like a full-time job, right? Um, that you can sort of, you know, your student debt shouldn't define you. Uh, we want to get you on these programs, but it shouldn't take up all of your time. So now there are alternative options to income-driven repayment plans. Uh, so these are extended repayment, graduated repayment, and extended graduated. That was a bit of a mouthful. So these are all uh, different repayment plans that are based on your debt amount, okay? Uh, so these are sort of under the standard plan umbrella. Uh, and what these essentially do uh, is they push out uh, your, your uh, payment uh, horizon uh, to 20 to 25 years, uh, and then therefore essentially lowering that monthly payment. Again, it's still based on your debt amount. So in the extended repayment, it simply pushes that out over a longer period of time, lowering that payment. On the graduate repayment, it pushes that out, 
but in a way that your payments increase every two years. So slowly but surely, you're inching up and paying more uh, each, you know, every two years. And then extended graduated, as you might have guessed, is a combination of the two, all right? So there are other options besides income-driven repayment that might end up actually being a lower monthly payment, depending upon your situation. Uh, and this is, again, being informed of your options is, is where, you, you know, the, the best place to start, right? Uh, because it's not just necessarily going to be one solution over the other. You want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're just seeing everything and choosing the best one for your particular situation. So here is the repayment plan checklist. You can visit studentaid.gov uh, and use their repayment calculator, um, or you're able to do this uh, over the phone with your servicer. You can contact your loan servicer uh, and they can send you an application to submit for an IDR plan or to get onto an extended or graduated plan. Um, and this is how you can submit that application. Or uh, you can visit borrowers.buysavvy.com uh, and we can help you to do this you know, right away today uh, and get your, get your applications in uh, as soon as possible, all right? So you have many options available to you. Like I said, you know, the borrowers.buysavvy.com is gonna be a way um, for you to also engage our support uh, experts if you have any questions or need any assistance. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about loan default, all right? So what federal loan default is, what some of the consequences are for defaulting on your loans, and what your options are as far as getting those loans back into good standing, and that's around loan rehabilitation. There is hope, uh, just being aware of, of those options and, and acting quickly. So moving on to the next screen, federal loan default uh, essentially uh, is triggered uh, once you've gone past 270 days past due. Technically, as soon as you are one day past due, you are considered delinquent, all right? But it's not until 90 days without having made a payment uh, does the servicer report to your credit uh, on, on your credit score. Um, and then it's not until 270 days past due uh, that you are technically now in default. All right. Uh, now, keep aware that if you see that little sort of that uh, star below there, if you have a Perkins loan, okay, they can technically put you in default after one day of missed payments. All right, I'm not saying it's necessarily likely, but uh, there are certain stipulations around certain loans that you wanna make sure that you're aware of, particularly if you have that Perkins loan. All right, so default is gonna be triggered after that 270 days. Now, if we move on to the next screen, what happens when you are going to default? What happens after those 270 days? Uh, well, Technically, uh, at the point of default, your loan becomes due in full. So they will send you a very scary letter that says, well, like, for example, if it was me, Lindsay, you have $200,000 due, you know, next month, right, on that loan. It's all due in full. Uh, you then become ineligible for financial aid, all right? Uh, you're ineligible for any of the repayment plans that we've talked about here today. Uh, you potentially, uh, or you're definitely going to have your, this reported to the credit bureaus. Um, you potentially could become ineligible for sort of military law enforcement or, or other potential jobs. Um, you also potentially could have your driver's or professional license revoked for being in default on your student loan. Uh, and then I would say probably these might be the worst two uh, that, uh, sort of the consequences. Uh, not only could you potentially have up to 40% uh, in collections fees added onto your, onto your loan balance, right? Uh, if it wasn't high enough already, but the worst sort of case scenario of a default uh, is when uh, you are experiencing a collection in, in, uh, in terms of wage garnishment, your social security is being withheld, or your tax return is being withheld, okay? Wage garnishment is gonna take 15% of every paycheck, all right, every paycheck, and once that goes into effect, it is at least four months before that can be stopped. Four months on a rehabilitation before that can be lifted. So that would be four months where every paycheck of yours, 15% is going right towards those student loans. So we really wanna to try to help you to avoid getting to that, that point. Uh, and, and really, it, it, you know, there's no sort of saying whether you're gonna go into wage garnishment over uh, tax withholding. Uh, it's all dependent upon your situation. And you know, one day that letter can just come in the mail uh, and you definitely don't want to, to be surprised uh, and, and you know, wanna have a plan of action. So how can you uh, rehabilitate a, a defaulted loan and get it back into good standing? Uh, so you're able to do this through what's called uh, default loan rehabilitation. This is a federal process. 
essentially you must make uh, and agree to make uh, nine payments uh, over the course of 10 months. You work with a collections agency to essentially determine a monthly payment amount that is reasonable and affordable. And what they usually do is, is they take you through and you fill out a form in which you indicate all of your expenses, okay, all of your household expenses, things like that, uh, as your income. And from this, this form, they're able to try to give you as low a payment as possible. You, normally, uh, from borrowers I've worked with, it is as low as $5 a month, okay? They're not trying to, to make this a difficult payment for you to make. They want you to succeed in this, all right? So if you pay $5 a month for those not, and make nine payments, okay, you can basically rehabilitate that loan and get back into good standing, all right? You can be eligible for future loans. You can be eligible to enroll in income-driven repayment plans. You can be eligible for forgiveness, as we're going to about to talk about on the next screen, all right? All it takes is just initiating that process um, for, um, for rehabilitation. And particularly right now under the CARES Act, uh, it's very important to know uh, if, if you were paying attention earlier, uh, that uh, you are able to rehabilitate a loan and have these non-payment months count towards those nine months. So if you are concerned that you might be in default in any way, I highly encourage you to reach out uh, to, to us and, and I uh, have provided our support information uh, because this will likely require a phone call, but we will want to help you initiate that rehabilitation as soon as possible uh, and help you to take advantage of this period of time. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Natalia and Cody, um, and hopefully maybe we'll take a little break to answer some questions that I'm sure you might have after that section. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for going over uh, these repayment programs. You know, unfortunately, unfortunately, these student loan repayment programs are very complicated. Uh, there's a lot of nuance. I think that's why we're so grateful uh, that your team at Savvy's put together this much easier to use tool and much easier to understand uh, resource. And, and that's exactly why we've brought this borrower outreach program together. Um, we really want to help distill this information. So thank you for that. Uh, I am going to take some questions. I see uh, a handful of them have been submitted in the Q&A box. If you have not entered your question, but you have one, uh, you know, please do so now. We will address additional questions at the end of the workshop. Um, but I have a question here. Uh, this is from Debbie, and Debbie was asking, uh, what if you want to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan, but it's not a repayment plan that you currently qualify for? Uh, is there something that you can do about that? Hey, Cody, it's, it's Lindsay. So, um, sure, it, it, depending upon what your current loan situation or, or type is, uh, and what type of repayment plan, uh, income driven repayment plan you'd like to qualify for. Um, so for example, uh, if you have a cell loan, uh, you're currently only eligible for an income based or IDR repayment plan. If you consolidate that, okay, into a direct consolidation loan, that loan will become eligible for all the different types of uh, IDR plans, okay? On the other hand, you could have a loan like a parent plus loan. And if you were to consolidate that loan into a direct, all right, consolidation loan, even though you've consolidated it, it is only going to be eligible for an income contingent repayment plan, ICR. So again, there's sort of a lot of nuances around, um, you know, sort of corrective action you can take depending upon the loans you currently have. Um, so you're gonna want to sort of, you know, uh, enlist Savvy's help. Um, and, and when you go through the Savvy tool, we will flag for you if corrective action would be necessary in order to potentially take advantage of additional savings. Um, so it sort of, it's going to vary based on your situation and from case to case. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, I've had a lot of questions here also about um, income-driven repayment plan during this COVID crisis. Um, I know, Natalia, you mentioned that the COVID-19 uh, suspension of payments uh, continues all the way until December 31st. But why should, I guess, a student loan borrower consider income-driven repayment plan right now, even if they may not currently have a student loan payment due? Yeah, that's a great question, Cody. Thank you um, to whomever asked that. So I think right now, you know, yes, you have a $0 payment and 0% interest. These are only slated till January 1st. 
Um, I don't know about you, but for me, I feel quite broke after the end of December with the holidays. And so that's not when I want to be repaying my student loan debt. Um, so what these income driven repayment plans do, especially for those folks who have lost their jobs or have less hours due to COVID or any reason, you can enroll in this program and set your payments for a year. And so that way, you know, if you did it today, you'd know August of next year instead of January, you would be repaying your loans. You also know that at least through January, you'd be at 0% interest. So it is a cheaper time um, to be in these programs because you won't have interest accruing at the beginning. We don't know what will happen beyond January 1st as it pertains to student loans. So um, the other thing is that we already see a lot of issues and problems with student loan servicers. And if all of the student loans come back online at the same time in January, I could see it being a big old mess. And so because of that, I, you know, one might want to consider doing this early, getting it out of the way, and then you just don't have to worry about it come the first of the year. Great. Thank you, Natalia. And, you know, I, I see a question here that I think is also uh, somewhat related and also very important. Uh, but uh, Laura was asking, you know, when should a borrower enroll in an income-driven repayment plan? Uh, and I answered to her in the chat box, and I want to share that with everyone here. Um, you know, a borrower can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan at any time. And so if you're facing unemployment or reduced income, especially during times like COVID, uh, you can enroll in these programs to uh, lower your monthly payment. And also, if your student loan does not qualify for CARES Act benefits, these student loan programs are still available to you. Uh, so this is a great option for borrowers. Um, and on top of that, lastly, if you experience inc uh, a disruption to your income when you're already enrolled in one of these programs, you can recertify your income and adjust your monthly payment at any time. So these are very flexible options that really respond to whatever needs you have in the moment. Um, and we know many people right now are, are facing difficulties. Uh, all right, I'm gonna take one more question in this section and then I will jump into some of the uh, other programs that are available to federal student loan borrowers. Um, let's see here. You know, actually, I've had a lot of questions. Lindsay, this is probably great for you all uh, just because of the complications you've faced dealing with student loan servicers and how you've worked to fix that. But a lot of people ask me in the chat box, um, what should they do if they get inaccurate information from their loan servicer or if they went to the Department of Education and the repayment tool wasn't correct, um, the, the repayment estimator at the Department of Education? You know, where else can they go to get accurate information and what can they do? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, m many times borrowers are, you know, don't have the luxury of being aware that, that they're being given inaccurate information, right? So, you know, first and foremost, if you're able to, to tell that on your own, then, you know, that's, uh, that's great. Um, but one of the, the things about Savvy and sort of our, our advanced technology um, is that we catch these mistakes all the time. Uh, and we are, you know, if you, whether you want to go through the Savvy tool and compare, you know, what you're getting, uh, you know, from one to the other, um, but you're always able um, to either call your servicer um, and have that sort of reviewed on the phone, uh, or you can work with Savvy and we can sort of help to escalate your case through the ombudsman system, uh, file that complaint and have it reviewed by a third party. Um, and within 15 days, that servicer will have to respond. So if you feel like you are getting a really inaccurate you know, if they're coming back and saying that this is the payment that you're eligible for and you feel that that truly is incorrect, um, that's one way in which you can do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, our support team at Savvy helps borrowers do this all the time. So I really would, you know, at no cost uh, allow us to be able to help you, uh, it, you know, if that would be helpful to, to you uh, in getting that taken care of. Perfect. Uh, with that, I'm going to just encourage folks one more time, if you have a question, to uh, submit it in the Q&A box, um, and we'll try to address it at the end of the workshop. I am looking at the clock. I know things are running a little uh, behind. Um, we encourage everyone to continue to join us for just a, a little bit longer. I'm going to cover our federal loan forgiveness options, which I know um, are valuable to a lot of borrowers working as teachers or public service uh, employees. 
so with that, I think we can jump right in into the federal loan forgiveness program. Um, you know, for many years, the idea of student loan forgiveness uh, was complicated. It was misleading to some borrowers. Uh, there was just a lot of confusion. Uh, but I am here to say that there are loan forgiveness options available to federal student loans if you meet some interesting requirements that I'm going to explain here. Uh, now, one of the one of the questions we get often from borrowers is how do loan forgiveness programs work, especially if you already are interested in lowering your monthly payment in an income-driven repayment plan? And the good news is that these programs work hand in hand. And in fact, if you want your student loans to be forgiven, you likely will want to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan because it will lower your monthly payments and will maximize the benefits you receive from one of these programs. So don't think that these are uh, exclusive programs. You can be enrolled in an income-driven repayment program as you make progress towards student loan forgiveness. And the first program I'm gonna cover is uh, a more focused program It's for teachers. Uh, this is the Teacher Loan Forgiveness Program. Uh, it exists on two tracks. There is loan forgiveness in the total of $5,000 for full-time teachers who work in low-income schools or education agencies. And these are teachers that work at elementary and secondary schools. There's another track that is $17,500 of teacher loan forgiveness. And this is eligible for, again, full-time teachers working in low-income schools. Uh, and these are for math and science teachers, as well as special education teachers at the elementary and secondary school level. Now, uh, like many of the programs, there are uh, narrow qualifying factors that you have to meet uh, for teacher loan forgiveness. You have to have a federal student loan that was used for undergraduate studies only. So that means a student loan that was offered to parents to pay for a child's education cannot qualify. Graduate loans uh, for graduate students do not qualify. And Perkins loans and private student loans do not. Uh, throughout the workshop, you're gonna see that loans that are in default do not qualify. That's why it's so important to make sure you enroll in the programs that keep your monthly payments affordable uh, because borrowers who fall into default lose access to these programs. And like we've mentioned before, if you have a loan that does not currently qualify, you may be able to consolidate into a loan uh, that does qualify. That's where consolidation can become a helpful tool for borrowers. And the second factor for teacher loan forgiveness is guaranteeing that your employer qualifies. So there is a list online at the Department of Education that is the annual directory of designated low-income schools for teacher cancellation benefits. This is a directory of all of the schools that are properly recognized as a low-income school that qualify for this program. So we encourage you to look there, see if your current employer qualifies. Uh, there are some borrowers that are teachers in an education agency. Uh, those are a newer addition to the program. So time working at these agencies after the 2007-2008 school year qualify. And unlike other programs where we would tell borrowers to contact the U.S. Department of Education, this program uh, directs folks to contact their state education department for more details. So you could contact the California Department of Education if you lived in California, uh, whatever your local agency is. Now that program covers teachers. There's another program that covers up to 25% of the workforce and that's public service loan forgiveness. Uh, now if you're a public servant and uh, you make 120 monthly payments while meeting the qualifying factors I'm about to explain, then you can have all of your remaining debt forgiven and it's tax-free. So this is a program that is by far the most generous uh, federal program when it comes to student loan repayment and forgiveness. Now, the problem with public service loan forgiveness in the past has been that there are qualifying factors and a complicated way of, of applying for the program. And so here are the basics of public service loan forgiveness. The first qualifying factor is that you are repaying a federal direct loan. So if you have one of these other federal loans, like a family federal 
federal family education loan, an FFEL loan, or a Perkins loan, that does not qualify towards public service loan forgiveness. That is exactly when you would use consolidation to create a new loan, which would be a direct consolidated loan. When you see direct in front of that loan, you know it qualifies for public service loan forgiveness. The second qualifying factor is, does your employer qualify? Now, uh, the reason that public service loan forgiveness is eligible to 25% of the workforce is because it includes anyone who works uh, for a government agency that can be state, federal, municipal, and local government. And it also includes anyone who works for a charitable organization, a 501c3. And that includes anyone who's employed by these agencies or nonprofits. So you could theoretically work uh, as a building maintenance professional at a government agency. As long as that agency is your employer, you qualify. And then lastly, which has been a thorn for many borrowers, you have to be enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan. And that includes the 10-year standard plan and all of the income-driven repayment plans we discussed. It does not include, however, the alternative repayment options, which include extended repayment, graduated repayment, extended graduated repayment, and it also does not include the typical deferment or forbearance periods. As Natalia mentioned, the administrative forbearance that's been applied because of the COVID-19 pandemic does qualify. So that can be a bit confusing with the language there, um, but those are important details. So if you meet all three of these requirements and you make 120 monthly payments, you can apply for public service loan forgiveness. Now, the problem is you have to come to the table proving that you've made all of these payments while qualifying for 120 months. So uh, you can see there, we say submit an ECF uh, for uh, annually. That's the employment certification form. This is a federal form that's at the studentaid.gov website. It is not mandatory for public service loan forgiveness. However, it does help you document all of your qualifying time so that when you go to apply at the end of 120 payments, you have the documentation that you need. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to reiterate what does qualify for public service loan forgiveness? As you see there, all direct loans qualify. Those are direct loans for students, direct loans for graduate students, direct parent plus loans for parents, and any direct consolidated loan. All levels of government employment qualify, 501c3 nonprofits qualify, and if you go to the Department of Education's website, there are other critical public service careers that do qualify that are um, related to healthcare, childhood development, public safety, things like that. And then lastly, the repayment plan. You have to be in either your 10-year standard repayment or enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And to just add additional clarity, here are the things that do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Again, the older federal family education loans do not qualify, Perkins loans do not qualify, loans in default and private student loans all are ineligible for public service loan forgiveness. When it comes to employers, we hear from a lot of folks who work as government contractors. If your employer is not the government or is not a 501c3, then you are not eligible, even if you work on government projects. Labor unions, 501c4s also do not qualify because these are uh, considered more advocacy-oriented organizations. And lastly, for those who work for 501c3, excuse me, for uh, nonprofit charitable, uh, excuse me, nonprofit religious institutions, you can qualify if your work is not religious instruction. So the time spent on the pulpit does not qualify. And then lastly, just to reiterate, all of these other repayment options do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So I mentioned that a lot of borrowers would have been eligible for public service loan forgiveness, but they found themselves in the wrong repayment plan. Uh, there is a fix for you. There was a temporary extended public service loan forgiveness program passed by Congress. It's first come, first serve, and it's got limited funds. 
But if you met all of the public service loan forgiveness requirements, except for you were in the wrong payment plan, this program works for you. The steps are that you have to submit a public service loan forgiveness application, and you have to have been denied because of your repayment plan. If that is the case, then you can request a reconsideration by emailing this email here. It's T-E-P-S-L-F at myfedloan.org. Uh, that is, FedLoan is a student loan servicer that handles all public service loan forgiveness requests, and they are uh, responsible for handling this program as well. Now, this program is very unique in its design, so I encourage you to visit the Department of Education's website at studentaid.gov to learn more about that. So just quickly, here is the loan forgiveness checklist. You know, we always encourage people to visit the Department of Education's website, verify that your employer qualifies, and use that employment certification form to keep documentation. Enroll in a qualifying repayment plan so that you don't uh, miss out on loan forgiveness just because you chose the wrong repayment plan. And then continue to work full time for 120 monthly payments. Uh, once you have done so, you can apply for the program. Uh, and until uh, and then from there, you may be accepted if you meet all the qualifications. And you know, as another reminder, the savvy tool helps borrowers enroll in all these programs and helps you follow up with the paperwork that you need. So you can visit borrowers buysavvy.com uh, to use their tool to uh, enroll in any of these programs as well. Now, we always include this one warning. Uh, because of the promise of student loan forgiveness uh, for in the federal program, there are a lot of scamsters out there that have used the idea of forgiveness and debt relief to take advantage of borrowers. Uh, you'll often see a bait and switch that includes messaging like immediate loan forgiveness or urgent deadline approaching. These are not the type of communications that you will receive from the Department of Education or that you will receive from your loan servicer. Uh, other legal practices include charging you upfront fees before, before uh, initiating a service, claiming to work on behalf of the Department of Education, uh, and promises of loan forgiveness that sound good, too good to be true. All of these are the kind of things that are red flags for what we call a debt relief scam. And we wanna just make you aware that these things do exist. You can contact the Department of Education, your loan servicer and trusted folks like Student Debt Crisis and Savvy to answer any of your questions. You do not have to pay for one of these scam services. So that wraps up all the education. We know it's a ton of information. So I just wanna remind people that all of today's resources and today's presentation is brought to you by our Student Loan Borrower Outreach Program. So the Student Loan Borrower Outreach Program is working to develop workshops, tools, and uh, one-pager handouts that we can give to borrowers to help them learn about these topics on their own and we're crafting them over time to be as effective as possible. So I encourage you to visit part of this project, which is the Student Loan Borrower Resource Center. You can visit the website there. It's bit.ly slash borrower resources. And if you visit that website, you can go to the next slide and you can see some of the resources that we've compiled. We've put together one pager subject summaries these are little documents that explain all of the complicated topics we've discussed today. Uh, those cover income-driven repayment plans, public service loan forgiveness, CARES Act relief, COVID-19 updates, all of the above. We also include on that website access to the student loan aid tool by Savvy. Uh, so again, that is the an auto automatic enrollment tool that Lindsay told us about. You can visit bit.ly slash borrower resources to see that. And also we will be including all of uh, our workshops uh, that we are hosting. This was recorded today. We will hopefully get that online in the coming days. If you're interested in seeing this workshop, you can also email me um, after today's workshop and we'll make sure to direct you to the right location. And lastly, because we are crafting these tools over time, we're improving them every day. We really need feedback from folks who've attended today's workshop. Uh, if you could give us input in the borrower feedback survey, it would be extremely helpful to us and it would be helpful 
to us to help borrowers in the future. So that survey is at the website that I shared with you all. You'll also receive a link in a follow-up email to today's workshop that will direct you there. Please, it is so important to us that we hear from you and we create tools that are as effective as possible. So with that, I know we've run a little long, but I think we can address a few more questions that I've seen uh, come through. Um, thank you all again for submitting your questions. Um, let's see here. This is a great question from Tiffany. Uh, Natalia, I'm sure you can answer this because we've worked on this topic for so long. But when a borrower wants to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan and they're using their income, what income are they using here? Is this last year's income that was filed at the uh, IRS? Is this current, current income based in last week's paycheck? Tiffany's just trying to understand where, how her repayment plan will be calculated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Lindsay, please feel free to add on as well. But, you mm -hmm. know, you, if anything has changed at all, you can go right now. Um, you know, if you lost your job yesterday, uh, you are able to change your repayment status. So you need to do a, and you have to do an annual check every year. They, that's the reapplication process where they will verify your income through the IRS. But if you don't have that, you are still able to um, take advantage of the program right away. Um, and Lindsay, if you'd like to add to that. No, I mean, I, th I think that that says it all. Um, you know, I think that uh, ultimately just knowing that this is, a, is an available option um, is the first step. And then, like I said, whether you, you do it on your own or you, you utilize Savvy's tool, um, either way, um, but so that you take advantage of your situation as quickly as possible. Yeah, and Lindsay, I know you've talked about it in the past before, so maybe you could add to this as well. But, um, you know, borrowers may have had a, a decent income last year, and now all of a sudden they're facing reduced income or unemployment. I think you've explained in the past to other workshops, like what kinds of forms of proof can a borrower submit to show that maybe they're facing hardship today that they weren't facing, you know, two months, three months, or a year ago? Yeah, that's a great question. So as far as um, supporting documentation um, that is uh, sort of you know, allowed when you submit this IDR application, uh, it, two, two, for, two forms, are, I should say. Either your most recent tax return, so that 1040 form, okay, many times borrowers will submit their W-2. That actually is not an acceptable uh, form, and your application will get rejected. So it can't be your W-2, but your most recent tax return, or um, your a current pay stub from within the past 90 days. And this is the one that many borrowers are unaware of. Um, and so, for example, the, the borrower that you described in that situation code, um, whose income has been, you know, impacted uh, or, or decreased more recently, uh, that wouldn't be reflected on last year's tax return, but it would be reflected in uh, a pay stub from the past 90 days. And so that's why they make that option available. So we can use a pay stub submit that uh, with your application, uh, and they will essentially uh, extrapolate your uh, income from that one uh, sort of, uh, you know, monthly payment. So they'll extrapolate for the year. So for many borrowers who, again, who have had that decrease uh, in their hours or their wages, et cetera, uh, submitting a pay stub is going to be the best option to get on an IDR that's going to most accurately reflect their income and hopefully minimize that payment as much as possible. Great, thank you so much. Uh, another great question here about uh, income-driven repayment plans, and um, I love to see these questions because it's from a current student. Uh, but this student is uh, going to graduate, and they're uh, they're aware that after students graduate their program, they don't have to make student loan payments within six months. Uh, but they want to know since they uh, there is currently relief for student loan borrowers, do they need to take any steps? to make sure that they're included in the suspended payments that are offered by the CARES Act. So Cody, I can try to take a stab at this one. Um, and you know, Natalia, could you jump in if you, know, you catch anything uh, that I might be saying incorrectly, but I believe if, um, you are your grace period uh, is within this time frame, so it will end before December 31st. 
uh, you will still be able to take advantage of basically, you won't have to go into repayments until January. Um, but I think, you know, you would just want to make sure, um, you know, regardless uh, of what your options are going to be come January, right? Um, so, you know, you're going to have you know, no payments through the end of this year, um, but January, potentially looking at, you know, an income-driven repayment plan, especially if you are a new grad and maybe last year didn't you know, even have an income, you could be eligible for as low as a $0 monthly payment uh, for that, that, you know, next 12 months. So that could be really beneficial for, uh, you know, a new grad going forward. Please feel free to add, add where I might have sort of, you know, missed anything, Cody or Natalia. I think that's great. And I'm, you know, again, I'm just so happy to hear that people who are currently in school or recently graduating, um, you know, are, are thinking about their student loan repayment. That is, you know, something that's newer as people have become more aware of this topic and earlier on. So, you know, good for you for being proactive about this and thinking about your student loan payment. Uh, that is the last question we have here, so perfect timing. I think we can end today's workshop. Uh, again, just a reminder for folks to take a look at the email that they receive following up to this workshop, and please take our borrower survey. Help us create the best resource we possibly can. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye-bye.